Good morning, everyone. Is this thing turned on? There we go. Good morning. How are you? Not so sure. All right. Now, before I carry on, because I'm not here every week, this is actually my first week here with you in 2014, I need to know, have you been introduced to our new teacher? You have? I know, she's going red. I'm embarrassing her right now. She's like a good teacher. She's right up on the front row, and we're glad to have you, Alexandra. Thank you. Do you want to stand up and just complete the embarrassment for us? All right, there we go, there we go. She's joined us uh, this year. She's teaching at our Adventist uh, primary school here and uh, has got the new entrance and, and a few years beyond that too, right? So we're glad to have you on the team. Thank you for being with us. And the friends, family, friends, friends that are with us as well. Thank you. Right, we're in uh, the Gospel of John this morning, John chapter 12. So please uh, join me in your, in your Bibles there. We're going to read a story together. A very interesting story that uh, comes, um, as all stories do, in a context. It comes as a direct follow-on from the previous chapter. So in John chapter 11, what's our famous story that happens in John chapter 11? Do you know without looking? It's the resurrection of Lazarus, isn't it? It is, the, it is the great pinnacle of the healing ministry of Jesus. It's the one that cannot be refuted. You know, there have been other resurrections. There's, of course, been a string of healings before this. People who have been sick and they've been miraculously healed and turned around. But here is a story in John chapter 11 of a man who dies, is buried for four days. It's, it's unequivocal. No one can deny it. This man was not in a coma. He was not in a deep sleep. He was absolutely and completely dead, his body was decomposing. That's why Jesus waits, and those four days, when you add them up, at least four, I think maybe even a touch more, but but, um, at least four days, this man, when he comes to the graveside, the family says to him, don't roll away the stone, it's going to stink. So everybody acknowledged, and Jesus resurrects a man who's not just freshly died, but is decomposing. And he does that to sentence himself to death. <laughs> I think that, what do you mean, Adrian? That's a, that's a strange, uh, strange thing to do. That was the outcome of what he did with Lazarus. And you're going to read that right now in John chapter 12, starting with verse 1. And here's how it reads. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Martha's doing what Martha does, right? But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. So Lazarus is now dead or alive? He's very much alive, right? And he's sitting at the table with Jesus, right? Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Notice that the story takes place between two, what shall we call them? Two brackets or two parenthetical statements. It starts off by emphasizing Lazarus who was resurrected. 
And after the story has played out in John chapter 12 there, it ends off by coming back to Lazarus who was resurrected and on account of him, many were believing in Jesus. In other words, this was the pinnacle of Jesus' miraculous works. This was indisputable evidence that Jesus was in fact not a fly-by-nighter, not in fact a magician, not in fact just some trickster, but he resurrected a man who was decomposing and that is compelling evidence. After all, all the scribes and the Pharisees have done to discredit Jesus, he goes and does something like this, which definitively gives credence to all his claims. His claims that he is the Messiah. His claims that before Abraham was, I am. The idea that I am the eternal, the pre-existent, the creator of all life. I do not borrow life. I am the originator of life. All those claims that almost got him stoned in the past are now verified by this action, this climax of action, where he resurrects a de decomposing man. And the scribes and the Pharisees now want to kill Lazarus to put away that evidence and get rid of Jesus who has stirred the people up with this evidence to believe in him. They are losing their power. They are losing their credibility. All their accusations are now exposed for what they are. They have been made and they want to get rid of this. This is your atmosphere in which Jesus is walking around. <laughs> this is the atmosphere in which he comes to church on a Sabbath morning, synagogue. This is, this is the stuff that was going on behind his back, the whisperings, the cloak and dagger stuff, conspiracy to commit murder by the religious leaders. This is the final week leading up to his death. Does this make sense? And now you can understand why. But in the middle of that, you have this little snapshot of a dinner party. Now, when you read Matthew 26 and Mark chapter 14, you will find that this dinner party was thrown by a man who's named. He's not named in this account of John chapter 12, but he's named in the other accounts. And his name is Simon and his appellation or his, his nickname or his, the thing he's known for is he's known as Simon the leper. Now here's what you have to know. If you were a leper, there was no cure. You would leave home, you would leave town, you'd go and live in a cave with a colony of other lepers and you'd wait to die. It was, the, it was the AIDS of our day. Does that make sense to you? It was the no cure solution. It was the inevitable, except worse than that, it was feared that it would be contagious and spread, and therefore, you were immediately ostracized. If you had leper, leprosy, that's it. You were gone. You lost your home. You lost your family. You lost your friends. You lost your town. You lost your, your vocation. You lost your living. You lost your money. You lost everything. You were, you were persona non grata. You didn't exist anymore to the rest of the townsfolk. So this man is sitting at the table in the company of Jesus, in the company of Lazarus, and in the company of a group of other people. And what's more is, he's the man who is the host. He is the man who is throwing the dinner party. So Simon the leper can no longer be the leper. Do you get the point? Because if he was still the leper, no one would be in his presence. But Simon the leper is a reminder of what he was in the past, but he has been recreated, renewed, healed, restored, and that is the reason for the party. This Simon is grateful because Jesus gave him back his house, his family, his living, his everything. He lost it all. It was gone, including his life. It was just a matter of time until this man was dead, buried, forgotten, off the radar, never more to be mentioned in history. But now he got it all back. Jesus healed him. And he responds in gratitude to throw this dinner party after Lazarus has been resurrected in the same town in which Lazarus has been resurrected. And there's this coming together of people for whom Jesus has done amazing things things. People whose lives have been restored and given back. A family decimated by the death of their brother now has their brother and provider back in their home. Their, their, their joy and their family ties have been restored. This man who had lost everything, he's, he's had his life restored. And so there is this dinner party of gratitude that is thrown for Jesus. Are you with me so far? 
In the middle of it, Mary comes into the room. And she takes this bottle, which is filled with perfume. And according to the other two gospel accounts, not this one, she starts by pouring it over his head. This account says it was his feet. She pours it over his feet, down over, over his head, down over his feet. Ah, oh, there's a mess. What am I going to do? No one thought to bring a towel. She takes her hair and uses it as the towel to clean his feet. This is the Jesus who just a few nights from now is going to have to wash the proud feet of his disciples because they will not wash one another's feet. Do you see the reversal of roles here? This woman comprehends something. She gets something. Just like Simon, who is motivated to throw this party of rejoicing because he got his life back, got his family back, got his home back, and then invites Jesus into that home, into that family, to be a part of that out of joy. This woman got her brother back from death, but understands that the cost, the cost of redeeming her brother from death is that Jesus swaps places, which means that she grasps that just a little while from now, maybe she doesn't know exactly when, but at some point not long from now, Jesus has to go into the grave that Lazarus was in. Jesus has to be buried like Lazarus was because Jesus gave Lazarus his life, which means that Jesus has yet to pay Lazarus's death. She understood something, the men, the disciples with him for three and a half years who argued against him every time he said something to the effect that the time is coming when, the chief, when I will be handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. Every time he would hint at his death, someone would stand up and go, no, no, you will not die. That doesn't fit our messianic picture. No, 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 you don't die. You're the hero. We all know that every good movie ends with a happy ending. A good movie doesn't end with the hero dead. You all know that. This was the disciples. You cannot die. This woman gets the fact that in order for Jesus to do what he has done for three and a half years, in order for Jesus to do what he's just done with Lazarus, give him back his life, there is a price that must be paid. And the only one that can pay the price is the one who spends the currency. Jesus is spending the currency of restoration, forgiveness, the currency of resurrection. And the only one who, can sp the one who spends that currency has to pay the debt. And she gets it. She gets it. So she takes 300 denarii, which is a year's worth of labor. An average person, I've mentioned to you before in other sermons, an average person, if you got them to come prune your vineyards or, or clean out your house or just average, average work for people in those days, one day of labor, one denarius. Very simple transaction. You work for your 8 to 12 hours, whatever it is, I give you one, one coin. It's called a denarius, right? So 300 denarii, denarii plural, plural for denarius, 300 denarii is 300 days worth of labor, right? That's like, that's like a whole working year. Now, let's think about this. This is, this, is, this is one bottle of perfume that was worth a year's worth of wages. What does the average person earn today? 30,000? Maybe 40? Maybe 50? But then you're going above the average, right, in this country, right? So, so let's say, let's just take, oh, let's just take 30,000. Have you ever walked into a perfume store in New Zealand and found a bottle of perfume worth $30,000 and thought to yourself, yeah, I'm coming back tomorrow to get that? It's like, no, you wouldn't do that, right? So is Judas not onto something here? I mean, is Judas not, let's be realistic about this. This woman has taken a year's worth of money and poured it out in a total of about 10 to 30 seconds in just, in just this, this, this random occasion, this random event. This, it's not even in the synagogue. It's not even, it's not, it's not even you know, it's just this, she just walks into the room, takes $30,000 worth of perfume and pours it over this man's head. Is Judas not onto something here? when he starts to argue for how ridiculous this is. I 
I think that if you and I were sitting in that room and we didn't have this little statement that Judas was actually wanting that money for himself, right? Because he was a thief. He was a corrupt treasurer. He was stealing out of the kitty. If you and I didn't have that statement of explanation, which the disciples didn't have when this happened, because they only figured all that kind of information out later, right? Because if they had figured that out at the time, they would have gotten rid of him. So at this point in time, they don't know what you and I know when we read the story. Would you not, if you were sitting in that room that night, would you not have agreed with Judas? I would have. $30,000 in a moment of time when there are people dying from starvation out there. I think Judas sounded really onto it. I think Judas sounded like the man who should be appointed as the head and the leader of our church. I think Judas sounded like a man who had the plight of people upon his heart. I think Judas sounded like a man of generosity, like a man whose life had been changed and transformed by the Bible. I think that's how Judas sounded. And when you read the other accounts, not mentioned so much in this account, but when you read especially Matthew 26, you'll find that Judas is not singled out for this crime. It says the disciples, plural. I think it started with Judas. And I think the rest of them looked at each other and went, he is so right. He is so right. Look at what just happened here. You know how much good we could do with this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are living from hand to mouth for three and a half years with no fixed place to call our home, going around doing good for people, struggling as it were, not knowing where the next meal is coming from, not knowing, not knowing how we're going to provide for the masses, not knowing how to do ministry. And yes, yes, it worth, yeah, yeah, a year's worth of life. Man, I would have been mad. <laughs> yeah. The disciples, just like us, were very slow to learn. It didn't matter what he did. When they came up against the next big hurdle, the record of Scripture is they were filled with unbelief. They had to see it to believe it. Again, he calms the storm. They get off the boat, feed the 5,000. How are we going to do that? Wait a second. I just calmed the storm. Trust me to do this. They don't learn the lesson. They were slow to learn. And without the information that you and I have after the fact, I want you to put yourself in that room with them that night and ask yourself whether just like them, you would have been fooled by Judas. Now notice this. Verse 7. Jesus said, leave her alone. So who's, whose side is Jesus taking here? Jesus makes a stand, doesn't he? He makes a very clear stand. He says, you stay out of the way of this woman. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Now there's a statement that has troubled me for a long time. <laughs> Because you read other portions of the gospel where Jesus is speaking, like Matthew chapter 7 and so on, and you will, you will read that, 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 that he, he says to the crowds, how you treat the poor is the test of your discipleship, doesn't he? He says, in the least, you give, the, you give this thirsty person something to drink, you, you clothe the naked, you, 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 you give food to those who are hungry, and in, the, in that you did it to the least of these my brethren, you did it to... Me, I hope, you're, I hope you can begin to see the, the struggle here. Now Jesus stands up and he says, listen, the, the plight of the poor is going to be with you forever. If you don't get to it today, don't worry about it. There's, there's, there's always going to be somebody else who's poor and hungry. I mean, is that not how it sounds? I want to suggest to you something different. I want to suggest to you that Jesus knew exactly what ruled Judas's heart. 
I want to suggest to you that Jesus knew that Judas was not surrendered to him. I want to suggest to you that Jesus may even very well have known about what happens to the money. I want to suggest to you that Jesus knew that Judas was ruled by pride and the love of riches and the love of pleasure, that he was ruled by unbelief, that he was ruled by anything except the God of the universe. I believe that Jesus knew that Judas was looking for something better but couldn't bring himself to surrender the gods that ruled his heart. He, he knew, he knew it was like just within reach. He was in the presence of Jesus. He saw what was going on. But instead of his worship being governed by the God of the universe, his worship was hijacked by the gods of this world. And Jesus knew this. And you must never forget that when you read this statement. Jesus wasn't minimizing the importance of dealing with and ministering to the poor and the hungry. What he was saying, what he was doing was exposing Judas in a very subtle way in front of everybody. What he was saying to Judas was, Judas, three and a half years you have walked with me. You have talked with me. You have ministered alongside me. Three and a half years you have had opportunity to do good to the poor. And you have not taken every opportunity before. For you, And now you want to stand up in public when money is involved and make it sound like you have the interests of the poor at heart. If you were serious about feeding the hungry, if you were serious about clothing the naked, if you were serious about giving drink to the thirsty, then it would be the pattern and the way of your life. Now all of a sudden, when there's a large sum of money involved, you fool the rest of the people in this room by con. Convincing them that if you just had the opportunity of this money, you would do this good. And I'm telling you, you don't do that good with the little that you have. He wasn't minimizing the need to take care of the poor. He was exposing a liar and a hypocrite by saying to him, All around you and every day of your life is the opportunity to serve the less fortunate. But you want to hijack my religion. You want to hijack spirituality. You want to hijack the finances of missionary endeavor. You want to hijack worship in the name of serving people when the only reason you want this is to please the gods that rule your heart, your pride, your love of riches. You want to use my religious system. You want to use my worship as an excuse to bow your knee, metaphorically speaking, to the gods that rule your heart. Jesus was exposing him as one who used religion for his personal gain, for his personal excuse, for his personal convenience. And this is what I want to challenge you with this morning. We would never do that in the 21st century, right? I mean, we would never hijack the worship of God and make it something any other than being about Jesus, would we? We would never make it about me being right. We would never make it about corruption and financial gain, would we? I mean, we would never, we would never use church as a way to build business contacts as our primary objective, would we? I mean, we would never turn the worship of God into some social business selfish gain, something like that, would we? We we would never use the worship of God for pride, right? I mean, we would never stand up front as a preacher or as a song leader or as anything else and covet and long for the recognition and the praise of others, would we? I mean, we, we wouldn't sing the way we sing, out of the fear of man to win your respect and your honor and your love. We, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't give our money charitably to the, to the service of God and to the feeding of the poor. We wouldn't do that to be seen by men, would we? Is there the possibility, even in the 21st century, that spiritual things, that the worship of God can be hijacked by our hearts. I'm not asking you to ask this for the person next to you. I'm asking you to ask this for yourself. Earlier on, we sang a song, a beautiful song, about the heart of worship and coming back to the heart of worship, which is all about, what did the song say? All about you, Jesus. 
And I want to suggest to you that this story stands on record today for people like you and I who can make Jesus the covering, the superficial covering to gain what we want for ourselves. We can hijack religion, hijack worship. We can hijack the name of Jesus and be a Judas, worshiping and bowing our knee to other gods, and religion provides just an excuse or a means by which to obtain what we really want. Now, I want you to contrast Judas for a moment with the one he is accusing. I want you to contrast Judas with Mary. What Judas said was true. She took a year's worth of wages and poured it out over Jesus. And I want you to ask this question. What ruled the heart of Mary in the moment when she did that? Because Jesus accepted what she did as true, as authentic, as genuine worship. It wasn't in church It wasn't in a formal gathering. It certainly wasn't part of what the church would call formal liturgy, the way we conduct the order of service. And yet what she does in this moment springs from the heart of gratitude. What Simon does in throwing this party for Jesus springs from a heart of gratitude. I want to suggest to you that these two had discovered what worship was about. Worship was about Jesus being at the center of it and our grateful expression for what he has done for us. I want to ask you, why do you sing the songs you sing? Why do you pray the prayers you pray? Why do you show up at church on the day you show up at church? Why do you do what you do in this thing that we call worship? Because I want to suggest to you that just like Judas looked pious, looked devoted, said the right things, he, he had the, 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 the air of religiosity around him. His worship was rejected because Jesus wasn't at the center of that. He was at the center of that, and worship was the means to obtain his selfish gratification. Mary and Simon are accepted by Jesus in what they give him because it was all about him. He had given them their lives back, their family back. He had given them eternal life. And they responded out of gratitude. I want to suggest to you that all authentic worship is the response to what God has done for you. Now, don't miss this. You come to worship because you have a need. There's nothing wrong with that. Simon had a need. Lazarus had a need. He was dead. He had such a big need, he couldn't ask for help. Does that make sense to you? You come to worship because you have a need. But you come to worship because you know the God who supplies that need. And it is the response of gratitude to the God who does this for you. How would worship change for you? How would the way you pray change? How would the motivation for singing change? How would your expression of worship change? Would it even look different if you were responding to God out of a grateful heart? I challenge you this morning. Is your worship about you? Or is your worship about the Jesus who is the answer to every need you will ever have? Who is the resurrection and the life, the great physician, this Jesus who restores and who heals and makes whole? This Jesus who gives eternal life and forgiveness, who gives a new life and a new birth. Is your worship about this Jesus Or are you using the worship of Jesus as an excuse to worship something else? What do you worship is my question to you. Amen.